So in a previous episode of the Seven Figure Squad, we discussed how many people today are finding themselves in situations that they never thought they'd find themselves in due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, problem is, lots of people think that they're starting a business, but in this episode, I'm gonna discuss the difference between having a million dollar practice or a million dollar business, which one is best for you in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad happening right now. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Oak Brook Terrace, Illinois, which is a direct west suburb of downtown Chicago. And uh, by the way, in a previous episode, I promised you, if you're commenting below, if you're commenting below, I was going to reward you a book. You're engaging, you're sharing your video, so I'm promising you, uh, three of you, a book here called The Laser Fund, and I'm taking the, uh, I'm taking the comments from that episode, and we're going to be announcing the winners on my Instagram tomorrow afternoon, 12 Central Standard Time, so make sure you follow my Instagram profile, at MoneySmartGuy, and you'll find out who the winners are from our post on my stories. So, with that being said, I, I also want to know from you, I'm going to give you a chance also to win. If you didn't win that book, uh, I'm going to make sure this is another opportunity for you to win a book too as well. So, I want to know, in your watching of this video, what do you think is better for you? A million dollar practice? or a million dollar business? One more time, drop it in the comment section below. What do you think is best for you? What do you think that you want? A million dollar practice or a million dollar business? And I'll discuss the merits and pros and cons of both. And so I'm wondering here, uh, for those of you who are probably disrupted because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of you are reconsidering a complete career change, or you're looking at other businesses, or you're looking at other different platforms that you're part of, and you're looking at what you know, the Seven Figure Squad is offering you in terms of education, awareness, strategy, so therefore you can get to your seven figure cash flow aspirations in the first generation of your family. Uh, I remember coming out of the Marine Corps and I said, man, I, I'm excited about this new career, thinking that I had a business. I thought I had a business. You know, Matthew Sapala Inc., Revolutionary Financial Strategies, Real Results, and I did that for 12 years. I had my own insurance practice, I was selling life insurance, I was selling annuities, me, myself, and I. I had a top contract in the insurance industry. I think I had a 135, 145% contract. And I thought I had a business. Well, lo and behold, guess what I had? I had a practice. And what exposed that to me? Tough times. What exposed that to me? The Great Recession, 08, 09, 2010. It exposed to me. I didn't have much of a business at all. But I had a fairly decent practice. So I want to break this down because some of you guys are thinking, I go to Vistaprint. I say, I, I, I'm a CEO, job title, CEO. Job title, go to Vistaprint and bring on your business cards. Business owner, when in all actuality, you're a practitioner. So in the book, Cash Flow Quadra by Robert Kiyosaki, again, just to kind of rehash things, one of my books, that my, my favorite books that changed my life and the way I viewed money, that, that, that I was exposed to a different way of thinking and said, man, my dreams, my hopes can be a reality. I just need strategy. And that's why we create these strategy videos. So therefore, you can, be a, you can become a first generation cash flow millionaire. And Robert Kiyosaki, who is not only Asian American, but also a United States Marine, man, that kind of fits me, doesn't it? He discussed the cash flow quadrant, right? He wrote the first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Second book was the cash flow quadrant, major impact in my life and how I make money in this country. You can make money, again, as an employee, you can make money as a self-employed person. Here's the thing, 90% of all people in America usually are stuck right here. They either have a job or they own a job. They're either working for a boss or the boss, or their customers, their practice owns them. Less often do people actually get from this category, this quadrant, from the left side to the right side, which is becoming a business owner or becoming an investor here, right? And this is temp less than 10% of the American population. So people are wondering why the rich are getting richer, okay? People are wondering why the, the, the wealthy keep getting wealthy is because they've understood this side of the game by thinking like a business owner, by thinking like an investor. Here's the thing. The whole mantra of the Seven Figure Squad is how to think like a millionaire and now watching these type of episodes is how to strategize like a millionaire and, and hopefully some of these things give you some strategy, some, some thoughts, some things to be aware of. So. Also in his book, the How the Rich Get Richer, Robert Kiyosaki writes down the five ways to become a millionaire. Okay, here it is. Five ways to become a millionaire. You can work for somebody, okay? Employ you. What's the chances of you becoming a, becoming a millionaire? Listen, last week I was discussing how uh, GE uh, pays its employees. 
And it was the how millionaires use life insurance to build wealth, create generational wealth. And I realized, uh, Larry Culp, by the way, he's got a great story on how he built a company uh, for consistent rate of return, or consistent growth rate, year after year after year. Now he's the new CEO chairman of, of GE. But Larry Culp's got a great background. He's, got, he's, got a, he's a Washington College graduate, MBA, uh, uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, he's been at GE for a year. And guess what he gets paid? Base salary, $2.5 million. You know the crazy part? You know, my wife and I are close to $2 million this year of income, uh, and we're not even done yet with the year. And I'm thinking to myself, man, as an entrepreneur, as a person that's thinking like a business owner, I'm almost getting paid the same amount of money as a CEO of GE. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm glad somebody recruited me into entrepreneurship because you can make a million dollars as an employee, but guess what? More than 40% of your income goes to income taxes, okay? What about net worth? People say, oh, you know, I'm a net worth uh, a millionaire. I'm an I'm a, a on-paper millionaire. Paper millionaire is what they call it, right? All my assets are, 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 even though I might have some assets, but all my assets between what I own, what I owe, minus that, that's my net worth. My assets minus my liability, that's my net worth, right? That's called a net worth millionaire. So therefore, example is I might have $2 million of real estate, but I have a million dollars of debt. My net worth is? A million dollars. You are a net worth millionaire. Number three, capital gains millionaire. You can buy and sell, buy and sell gold, silver, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, baseball cards, uh, exotic cars, a flip real estate. That's called capital gains. Here's the problem with capital gains millionaire is that you got to buy something, so therefore you can sell something, so therefore you can make a profit called capital gains. It's another way to become a millionaire. Number four, you can be, you can be lucky. You know, win a lottery, marry the right person. Um, you know, you luck out and you're one of those folks that uh, want to get Rich that way, knock yourself up, being lucky. And last but not least, cash flow millionaire. And that's the mantra of this YouTube channel, which is how to become a first generation cash flow millionaire. Because all these four different ways to become a millionaire, guess which one gives you the most control? Control. I like number five because it gives me the most control regardless of the market, economy, circumstances, board of directors, customers, nasty customers. I can still maintain my cash flow and still become a cash flow millionaire year in, year out. I like number five. So let's break it down. So these are things, again, how to become a millionaire. And here's the mantra of this video. Here, here's the purpose of this video. Is I, I, I've discovered a lot of people say, you know what? I want to be a millionaire, but I own a business. No, you don't. You own a practice. Let me, let me discuss the, the difference between the two. A practice. What, what do you mean by practice? You're a small so you're a small business, what we call a mom and pop shop, yourself, maybe your wife, yourself, maybe a partner. You have three, four, five, 10, 15, 20 employees. That's called a practice, okay? Why? Why is this important? Because the pros of it is because it's based on your talent, okay? You are good at this. You're good at whatever. It's based on your talent, okay? You can control it because you're the talented person, and that's the reason why people do business with you. Uh, you're providing a service. Okay, that nobody else can provide. You have such a uniqueness about it. People come, come across town to have your service. Okay, Reputation. You have such a reputation in the marketplace that nobody does it good as you and everybody knows it because they've experienced your service. And that's why they do business with you as a practitioner. There's focus. Small. You don't, you, you don't do a lot of things. Uh, uh, you focus on one, 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 uh, one category, uh, one area. Uh, you're an expert at it. You're a specialist at it. You're focused on it. And it's also simple. Why? Because if you do it over and over and over every day, every week, every month, guess what? You become a expert. You even become more of a talent. You become even more of a, a reputation-based type of person. And guess what? That's the pros of becoming a practitioner. You own a practice. Okay? Here's the cons, though. It's dependent upon you. What happens one day, you decide that you don't feel like it, or you're sick, or worst case scenario, you got the COVID-19 and you're having to recover from it, okay? You're out 14 days in quarantine. What happens to the rest of your business? What happens to order fulfillment? What happens to somebody depending on you to fulfill that order, to deliver that product? What about revenue? Your revenue is only based on sales, your ability to execute, your ability to say, you know what, I sold this product, I sold this contract, I, I, sold, this, um, I sold this deal, but it's only based on sales. If you don't sell something, nobody's making money. And if it's based on you, guess what? There's a whole lot of pressure on your shoulders. And by the way, that was my, the whole pressure I felt for 12 years without even realizing it, that man, this, this was, was getting heavier and heavier and heavier because I wanted more out of life. When I wanted more out of life, I had to double in my marketing, I had to double in my expenses before my revenue started increasing. 
But uh, revenue is only based on your individual uh, uh, sales or your ability to sell a product or a service. Uh, kind of like an attorney. The only way an attorney makes more money is they charge more billable hours. So this is it. You have a practice. That's why you hear a lot of lawyers say, yeah, I have a law practice. You hear a lot of doctors saying, I have a dental practice. I have a medical practice, insurance practice, real estate practice, practitioner, because it's based on them. And here's the thing too as well. It's finite and it's linear. So in other words, it's only based on the last sale, the last contract, the last patient. It's finite. There's only 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 168 hours a week. And it's based on linear, uh, basically your, your, uh, on linear scale. So in other words, you make money and here you sell, 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 boom, it's linear. Okay. And as long as you keep doing it, it's linear. It never takes on a life of its own. Okay. Now, before I go into the pros and cons of actually owning a business, let me discuss some case studies of some practices that are up for sale. They're selling their practice, okay? This is the monetization, their exit strategy is say, you know what, I'm done doing this, I wanna sell it. Uh, I have an asset called a practice, I wanna put it up for sale. Okay, so here's some sales, of, um, here's some current practices up for sale, okay? Is an established solo, solo ob guy practice. Um, uh, so remember, solo, it's probably one doctor in there, and they are selling it for $200,000. They're getting out of being an ob guy doctor, um, and now they're selling it for 200,000 bucks. Here's another medical practice up for sale. Bariatric practice. Bariatric practice. You know, they, they have a collection of average of $400,000, but they're selling the business for $150,000. They're selling for $150,000. They say, you know what? Even though we have an average collection of $400,000 in revenue, uh, we are selling it for $150,000, okay? Less than what they're actually collecting. Um, and I'll explain here in a second why. Uh, dermatology practice, average collections of $800,000. They're selling it for $700,000, less than what they're actually collecting. I'll explain again probably why. Internal medicine, they're selling for $160,000, okay? Uh, a gastroenterology practice, average collection of $658,000. They're selling for $250,000 practice. I'll explain to you why. And for example, people in my field, I've never heard of somebody sell their life insurance practice. I've never heard somebody sell their annuity practice. You know why? Because probably no value to it. Here's why. The reason why these doctors and uh, dentists and medical practitioners as well, I'd say insurance practitioners, and by the way, I've never heard of somebody say, I just sold my real estate practice. I've, I've, listen, I've been in business for 21 years. I'm, I've been in and out of different um, uh, networking groups and I'm tied into all the who's who. I've never heard of somebody saying, I just sold my insurance practice. Maybe my insurance agency, but not my insurance practice. I'll give you an example, why? Because it's based on this person. The practice is based on the talent. The, 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 the practice is based on somebody that, can de that is dependent upon delivering those services. So I'll give you an example. If they sell this practice and the patients were used to seeing, used to seeing Dr. So-and-so or life insurance agent so-and-so or attorney so-and-so and they're no longer there and they don't like that new person, they don't get along with them, they have either a bedside manner, they don't have a good rapport, they just don't have a feeling of trust with the new person that bought the practice, guess what happens to that patient? Guess what happens to that customer? They are gone. And so for the valuation of this practice is significantly less than what you can sell it for a business. So with that being said, let's discuss the pros and cons of actually building a business. Boom, uh, a business, some of the pros, it's based on product and protocols. Product protocols is based on process. Uh, uh, why? Because you needed to scale. You needed to say, okay, I have one salesperson, five salespersons, 10 salespersons. Um, I have one doctor, five doctors, 10 doctors. I have one uh, attorney, five attorneys, 10 attorneys, 100 attorneys. You went from being a deliver, you're delivering a product or a process or a protocol, and now you're scaling. You're increasing the amount of people that can deliver that product, that protocol, that process. In return, you're now scaling. You have more people, more hours in a day. You have more manpower out there bringing their revenue. In addition to that, you are creating revenue not only based on sales, but on the equity of the business that is actually building. So the next point here is the revenue is not dependent upon a provider. So if you are owning this type of business, for example, I've met a lot of hospital administrators, but I don't see them practicing medicine. Does that make sense? I've seen a lot of people that own businesses that may own a McDonald's, but they're not flipping hamburgers, okay? My twins were working at McDonald's, the first jobs. I said, babe, 
How many times have you seen the owner, the franchise owner of the entire McDonald's? She goes, hmm, I see the manager, shift manager, team leader. You know what? I've been here for six months. I've never seen the owner of the franchise. Exactly. Because you know why? Because they own a... They own a business. They own a product and a process. They've scaled it. They've got the systems that run the business, and, and that's how it creates revenue, and it's not dependent upon the provider. So with that being said, with the good, there's also the bad. Pros, cons. What are the cons of actually owning a business? Well, you got to build and manage departments. You got to, for example, for an example, my business, we got to manage the new business department. You got to manage the licensing department. You got to manage uh, HR that takes care of everybody. You got to manage compliance. You got to manage finance, commissions, marketing, right? So there's so many different departments that, uh, uh, and, and you are thinking, wait a minute, I'm just trying to get a product or a process or a protocol sold, and now I got to learn how to run and supervise and, 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 super, uh, and manage departments? That's another skill set you have, that you have to learn. Uh, capital, it's pretty capital intensive. You need money for research and development. You need money for technology. You need money to keep yourself cutting edge. You need, a, you need a equipment to keep your, your, your 10, 15, 20 people uh, rolling instead of waiting on one thing being created and selling it at a time. That's going to take a lot of capital. Uh, operations, you got to have to say, you know what? Even though I was an expert at this, even though I was a doctor, even though I was an insurance person, even though I was an attorney, even though I was a real estate person, I got to learn how to operate my business. I'm known now no longer as a practitioner. I'm known now as an operator. Last but not least here, you got to build yourself. Personal development, leadership development. Why? Because you have these departments that are being, uh, being run and, and overseeing your operation. If you don't know how to manage people, you don't know how to lead people, you don't know how to find out what's in it for them, how to create a, uh, a, a, an equitable plan for an incentive for them to all want to fight and, and build and be focused on the one, one, uh, one cause. That's all based on leadership development. And, here, and here's the thing too as well. I hear a lot of people that own practices, you know, and they say, you know what, Matt? I, I, uh, I just don't want to babysit nobody. Listen, if you think that building yourself and leading people is babysitting people, listen, leadership is beyond you, my friend. Business ownership is way beyond. You'll never own a business with that type of attitude, which leads me to other things I'll, I'll discuss here, uh, um, why you'll actually exing yourself out of a lot of opportunities by you thinking that way. By the way, guess who used to think that way? Yours truly. I used to think that way too as well. I said, you know what, I don't want to deal with this person's headache. I don't want to deal with this person that uh, does, not mo uh, does not motivate me, does not motivate themselves. I don't want to be around this type of person. Well, that, base, that goes based on your, hi your hiring process. That goes based on the department of, of HR. Are we actually attracting the right people? Am I recruiting the right people? Are we interviewing the right way? Those type of things that go inside a, inside a business protocol, inside a, what we call a standard operating procedure on how to run your business. Now, before I continue on, some of the things you need to have has a checklist as a marker and we'll figure out which is best for you, let's look at some businesses for sale. I discussed earlier what some practices are for sale, but let's look at some businesses that are for sale. So there's a, there's a uh, business here. So they're, they're, a, they're a plastics and resin uh, based resin supplier. And guess what they're selling for? $3.2 million, $3.2 million. Hmm, interesting. So in other words, they're selling more than what is actually bringing in revenue. Sheet metal, this person is selling for $2.7 million, even though the gross revenue is 1.5. Remember in the practice, the gross revenue is let's say 800,000, but they're selling for 250,000. They're going the opposite. See, businesses go the opposite way in terms of they can ask more because they have what they call a multiple they can ask for in terms of the purchase price of that business. Landscaper, is it, it isn't just, it's just you know, one person with a, with, with a lawnmower and, and a blower machine on the back, but they actually have a business that they're selling. So this business is selling for $18.9 million. How would you like to take your mom and pop you know, landscaping service and scale it to a point where you can sell it for $18.9 million. See, that person went from just mowing lawns, they incorporated some of the things that we're talking about, and now they're selling for $18 million. They're just not selling the routes, they're selling the equipment, and they're selling the relationships. Notice the difference between what a practice sells for and what a business sells for. Generally speaking, a practice sells for less than what it's bringing in because it's, it's based on the provider, the person running the business, the talent that owns the, owns the practice versus a business that's selling because without a provider, without somebody that's actually having to push all the buttons, they make money with or without the operator. They make, make, they make money with or without the talent, you see? And so, for example, in my, in my wife and I, in our, in our insurance business, uh, we, we, uh, this year we'll finish up approximately, approximately $20 million in gross sales we'll do as, a, as an insurance firm. But our revenue, our revenue is based in our activity and our sales, one to most 2% is based on our own activity. 
as an example. Let me repeat that one more time. One to 2% of our revenue and our sales are based on our own activity. In other words, if we step ourselves to the side, the business is gonna run 98% fine without us. So the, the problem here is if, if you, as an insurance person, you as an attorney, a doctor, a dentist, okay, landscaper, if you have a small mom and pop shop or small practice, and you don't have scale, you don't have systems, guess what happens to you? If you don't feel like it one day, you wanna call in sick, you wanna take a vacation, guess what, there's no revenue coming your way. And you hope that whoever you delegated it to takes care of your customers as well as you might have while you're gone. Uh, and hopefully you have a practice or a business to come back to uh, because it wasn't you delivering the product. Okay, so a couple of things to check off. A couple of things that I have as markers. Here's seven things that you should consider uh, when either deciding to have a practice or a business. Because here's the thing. It's not to say what's better. You gotta figure out what's better for you. So here, capital. Do I have money for capital? Ask yourself, how much money do I have to put up for this practice? How much money do I have to put up for this business? Okay? And in, in addition to that, a, su a sub question is if I put up this amount of money, what type of revenue can I receive? And what time frame can I receive that revenue? Otherwise, you're going to have to go into debt. Otherwise, you have to go into uh, raising capital in terms of raising money from investors. So, what type of capital do I need? Time and revenue that I'm able to, I'm able to earn. Systems. What type of standard operating procedures are already there? In other words, do you have to, from scratch, teach somebody how to be a receptionist? Uh, from scratch, you need to teach somebody how to be a nurse. From scratch, you have to teach somebody how to sell life insurance. From scratch, you have to teach somebody how to get business as an attorney. Are there systems there in place? Okay. Do, you have to, do you have to develop systems? Uh, are systems already in place? So if it's better for you, do you have to develop them from, from, from scratch or are there already existing systems that's already in place that somebody can help, help develop and install? Scale. How do you go from one customers to 100 customers to 1,000 customers? Okay, can you deal with 1,000 customers? Do you want to deal with 1,000 customers? Do you have 1,000 customers? Do you want to help 10,000 customers? See, in, in my book, you know, the, the, you know, the way I'm wired is the more money I'm making is the more people I'm serving, the more people I'm helping. That's just the way I'm wired. I'm not so sure if you're wired that way, so you have to figure out, how are you wired? Do you, would you rather deal with small clientele or large clientele? Listen, the big reason why I decided to go in business for myself is the big wow factor I got when I started learning the rules of the money game. I said, I was, I, was, I was saying to myself, how many more people just like me, how many more people like my mom, how many more people like the, the family members and people I love and care about are being robbed of financial literacy and financial freedom and financial independence because they don't know the rules in the money game. And that's a big reason why I got involved in, inside the insurance industry, to teach people the basic rules of how to build a financial house so therefore they can build wealth and pass on wealth. And that's a big reason why I said, you know what, I, I, I want to help more than 80 to 100 clients a year. I want to write, write more than 80 to 100 policies a year. And, and fast forward in the, last, in the last five years, but because we scaled and actually built a business, we incorporated these things that we talked about earlier, we went from helping 80 to 100 customers a year to now 45,000 customers in the last five years combined. So what would you rather have? Does it fit into your mission just to help a few and, and, it's, and it's finite? Because here's the thing, too, what I didn't cover earlier is that a, a, a business has got exponential revenue. It goes like that. Sure, there's a little bit of heavy lifting in the beginning, but boom, it takes on the life of itself if you build it right. The other thing is sustainability. So can I make money with or without me? Is this sustainable if I'm incapacitated for three months, six months, I, t I take a sabbatical, I, I, I decide to take a step back, or I decide to take a vacation, or I want to focus on this area? Who knows? 20 years from now, you might feel different about your practice or your business. But is your income and your business still sustainable and growing and is it also adapting? Predictability. If you do this, do you get that? If you innovate and grow, uh, do you have the predictability? Do you have the departments to make sure that if we're going to invest time, money, research, and development, that I'm going to create revenue here? Or are you just trying to figure it out all by yourself? Winging it along the way, hopefully. And what a business does, it actually recruits and attracts people that are specialized in those departments to help you make better business decisions. Flexibility. Do you want your employees to have a piece of the pie? Right? Because, listen, if you're a big thinker, there's plenty of pie to go around. There's plenty of ways to slice this pie up. But if you're a small thinker, I don't want anybody sharing my revenue. I don't want anybody sharing my profit. You're probably more a practitioner than actually a business owner. And last but not least, saleability. What is my exit strategy? Do I want to say, you know, uh, I could care less about this and uh, I'm glad I did it for 30 years. It was a good ride. I'm going to retire. I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to enjoy the 30 years of building my practice, sell it for whatever I can get it for it, and then take those proceeds and then live off that for the rest of my life. 
You have to ask yourself this. Or as a business owner, do I want to say, you know what? I want to make sure this is legacy. I want to make sure I can, I can, I can sell it to somebody who wants to, what they call a merger and acquisition type scenario where they acquire my business as, as an asset under their umbrella. Who knows? But do I have a saleable opportunity more as a practitioner or business owner based on what is a fit for me? So as I wrap up, question to ask yourself, back to that first question, before you enter in all this stuff, before you enter in all this stuff, what's the best fit for me? What is better for me? Not what is better, but what is better for me? What do you see yourself doing? What do you see yourself accomplishing? Do you have a grand big vision to help hundreds of thousands of millions of people? Or am I comfortable with my 80, 100, 200 clientele top list? Whatever that fit for you is, knock yourself out and make your decisions in your platform to fit what is it that you want to accomplish. Number two, am I thinking both short-term and long-term? The biggest problem I had when I first started my insurance career is I was thinking too short-term. I'm a big contract, big contract, big contract. I'll go get leads. I'll go do dinner seminars, do dinner seminars. I'll get customers that way. Great, I saw 80 to 100 customers. And next thing you know, 12 years later, guess what I started feeling? Burnout. Matter of fact, I started feeling burnout by my eighth, ninth year. I just kind of dealt with it. And so I dealt with it because I'm saying to myself, I'm just a single dad. I don't know what else I'm going to do. I have zero patience to go back to college. Let me just deal with it. Let me do it for another year. Let me do it for another year. And I got, I, I got so much pressure. I got tired of it. The same pit in the stomach that I had uh, when I had the job uh, on Sunday nights. And I go back to the job. I, I loathed and dreaded on Monday morning. I had this feeling in my stomach. Like, ah, I got to do this again tomorrow morning. Well, I had the same feeling in the pit of my stomach every December 31st because all my year's success, I got to repeat from zero January 1st. So are you thinking too short term that I'm paying my bills now? Am, am I losing my best people? What happens in my practice? Here's a problem though. In my practice, if I build somebody, if I incorporate some form of leadership development, they get good and I'm really truly helping the people in my staff, they get good and I don't give them a piece of the revenue. I don't give them a partner position or I give them an equity position. Well, I lose my best talent that I built on my Rolodex, that I built relationship with over years, that exposed into my world, my friends, my kids, my mentors. What happens if they outgrow you because you're thinking too short term? They're thinking long term, but you're thinking too short term. Are you stiff arming their development? Are you stiff arming their growth? And if you do that, how will they feel about you when they step on and out? Chances are they're gonna be your biggest competition because they're gonna have a chip on their shoulder for you holding them back if you don't have a long-term vision about what you want to accomplish. Number three, am I building a legacy? Am I building something that I can hand to my children if they so choose to, 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 to inherit it? Can, can, I, can I give it to somebody to sell it? What is my exit strategy? And then last but not least, will this business decision for me stand the test of time? Many people thought they had a business or exposed that they actually have a practice. They picked the wrong industry. They picked the wrong business model. They picked the wrong mentors, and because the test of time exposed that in the worst of times, boom, I have little to no business. I picked the wrong industry. I picked the wrong platform. I picked the wrong model. I have zero systems. Well, here's the thing about bad times, and I'm glad you're watching. If you're watching this right now, I'm glad you're watching this in tough times because tough times create strong leaders and strong businesses. And just to keep in mind, it's tough times that I say, man, I'm glad I made that business decision. I'm glad during tough times, I still have a sustainable business that are growing and thriving. And believe it or not, listen, during the worst of times, uh, I'm, I'm reading every insurance man, because I'm in the insurance industry, I'm reading even every insurance magazine, every report of what happened in the second quarter of 2020. A lot of life insurance sales dropped. Just not us. Everybody dropped 20, 30%. Here's the crazy part. We are up 43.4%. Why? Because we incorporated a lot of these things before we knew the crap would hit the fan. And thank goodness we did. And thank goodness we have a bunch of leaders and, and people that are willing to pivot, adjust, and adapt. Why? Because we bought into leadership development long time ago. Not lead development. Not, not seminar development. Leadership development. So, a couple of videos I want you guys to watch. Uh, number one, so some of you guys are saying, okay, Matt, I got some cash, I got some capital, I, I got this kind of figured out. How would I best invest 5,000 bucks to get my business started? Here, check this video out. The best way to invest 5,000 bucks. And for some of you who say, you know what? I got it, Matt. I invested 5,000 bucks. Whatever money I invested to start my business. Okay, here's another video I want you guys to watch. How millionaires build wealth using life insurance. This is Life Insurance Awareness Month and a very little known talked about strategy to save you and build you a lot of money in a very tax advantage way. 
it's not just for dying, it's more importantly for the living. Watch this video here and how millionaires build wealth and use life insurance to do just that. That being said, drop your thoughts, drop your comments below. I'd love to know what you're thinking. I'd love to know what you are actually leaning towards. Is the Seven Figure Squad community more practitioners or the Seven Figure Squad community more business owners and actual entrepreneurs that are looking to scale and grow their business to have the most amount of impact, so therefore the amount of customers you reach and help, the more revenue you create. With that being said, guys, I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our business page. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit notification, be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. With that being said, thanks for tuning in. I'm your money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.